Okay, so thank you for being here. I'm, I'm Joel Falku. I'm a Chief Technical Officer from uh, Numscale. Uh, in this talk, I will talk about some kind of um, um, return over, over the, the time we spend trying to move our C++ library to C++14. Uh, I will speak colloquially about C++14, but that's really more like C++11 slash 14. Uh, I consider that C++14 is exactly what 11 should have been. So, Except for compiler support, ideas are basically the same. So what, what are we doing? So we are, we are a company that deal with providing software libraries for high performance computing. And uh, one of the things we really wanted to be able to do is to stay on top in terms of bleeding edge C++ technology. So after a while, we wanted to start revisiting our code base and trying to integrate the new um, elements that the new C++ standards was, uh, was bringing to us. Uh, and the thing is that some of our libraries were like something like eight or 10 years old of continuing development. So we had a lot of stuff to do. So I will try to speak about the stuff we learned doing this. Um, it's probably a technically light talk, but so a bunch of piece of code and probably a bit of a bunch of demos. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me if there is something uh, with respect to what I present, which is unclear, so I can actually explain uh, in a bit more depth. So yeah, so we are in 2015. That's bloody right time to move to C++14. Okay. Uh, it's a growing concern. We, we had a lot and lots of our um, clients and co-workers, collaborators that are currently trying to know if they should do this, you know, change. Uh, for a long time, it was a difficult question because the support of C++11 and 14 in existing compilers were, let's say, flaky or at least uh, unhomogeneous. And uh, with times, uh, well, I mean, my, my, main, my main development machine is a Windows machine using MSVC 2015 and everything works as I, as I hope it should be. So even Visual Studio or other compilers are now getting us a very basic C++14 support that make you able to use all the fancy stuff. So, and, and the standard itself uh, as you know, uh, grow and um, its adoption in terms of, you know, uh, good items, how to do stuff is now, you know, pervasive. You can find a lot of information about it. So, I mean, it, it's the right time to do this. But the question we had was, okay, isn't it making the C++ language even more complex? Is there is some kind of, you know, a complexity creep into adding lambdas and viaduct templates and all those new ST algorithms? And is all of those features really worth it? I mean, should I, should I be using this or that because I know I will win somewhere? And most importantly, uh, with the people I work with, that will be probably be reviewing my codes, making comment on it, trying to use it as, uh, you know, as a pseudo client, would they get what I am writing without having to resort to, you know, quoting the standard like the Bible? And while trying to know what we should be doing, uh, we, we coined the term what I call the sustainable C++ mode of writing. So that's an old XKCD uh, comic. So that says that the rate of usage of sustainable is actually unsustainable because by 2061, uh, every sentence will contain sustainable. So, <laughs> so well, what do we mean by sustainable C++? Sustainable C++ is a C++ that do what you want to do in the most concise way, using the exact proper tool to do it, with it being a library or language features, in a way that basically, the code and intent must be obvious, even if the tool you use to express it may be a bit complex. But by looking at your code, you should be able to know what is going on. And it should be clear for you, that's the first goal, and for future you, future you could be you in five minutes after you break, okay? In the worst case. Um, so, and you, it has to be clear for everybody looking at the code, okay? And we claim that C++14 actually helped us achieving this state of affair. Uh, we worked with Edward on, uh, on a metaprogramming library, which is called Brigham. We have a lightning talk on that later. It will speak about it a bit yesterday, uh, which is basically a re-implementation of MPL. And uh, the old code base 
uh, is perfectly readable and fit into probably less than a thousand lines of code instead of the monsters that MPL is right now. So you could actually do complex stuff in a very concise way so that when you look at it, it makes sense and it will keep making sense later. And that's what we actually wanted to do more than, you know, getting all the fancy bell and whistles of C++14 in. So and this talk is about what we actually try to do and what we learn to be, uh, to be the correct way of doing things. So let's see what's, what's going on. So we, as I say, we have a bunch of library. Uh, that's probably the most um, visible right now. We have a bunch of uh, metaprogramming library to address stack dispatching abstraction. We have a portable CMD API library. Uh, we have a MATLAB clone in, uh, in C++, and we have a tool which is called BSP++, which is something that you can actually deploy a parallel application uh, in the world uh, using very consistent. So it's all, it's all based on two things, mostly performances, well, CMD, computation, parallel application deployment. So we, we have to ensure that whatever we've wrote, it's, it's efficient. Okay? And the second part is we use a lot of uh, let's say uh, template metaprogramming with big quote, air quotes, uh, which means that we have a very emphasis also that we need to know what's going on in our types. We, we do a lot of types computation and uh, higher order function programming, stuff like this. And when doing this using C++ 3, well, it was not that easy. Well, compile time first, okay, because most of the time when we were trying to do something clever in terms of API or something really efficient, uh, we had to deal with a huge amount of templates, uh, which may require a huge amount of macro to get it right, uh, which lead to a huge amount of compile time. Um, well, which was basically what template programming was about in C++ 3. Um, we had very complex customization points. So customization point is basically um, protocols you enact at some point, so you can say your users, okay, if you want to change the behavior of these data types or to pass a function to these algorithms. This is what you have to write. And most of the time we have to delve into, oh, okay, so you want to pass us a function that say, oh, you want to distribute the data over the network. So, okay, it's easy. You have to write a template class with a template operator function call that also be a template substruct, which is a result of protocol implementations that will compute the type of the stuff you should be returning from the function call operators. And usually at this point, everybody was dead. So it was very complex, and that's, and that's just for passing a freaking function to an algorithm in the proper way we wanted to be doing. Uh, another point that we wanted to be able, especially in NT2, uh, to be able to say, uh, as a user, I've wrote this structure. Let's say it's, a, for example, it's a pixel structure. It's four uh, integers, uh, RGB and alpha channel. And I really, really want to have a table of these structures, and I really, really want it to be as fast as if I did it, you, I did it this four table by hands. Oh, yeah, of course, that's easy. You just have to use this boost vision add abstract macro, which the documentation is probably over there somewhere, and then you have to call another macro to uh, make understand our libraries that this is a function sequence, and so on and so on. And when you go through these 12 points, you know, customization systems, uh, you're probably not done yet. So, <laughs> So it was complicated. So we wanted to simplify that because a library is only as useful as you can actually adapt to what the users really want to do. And uh, well, I put that into limitations, but that's more state of affairs than anything else. We had a very, very heavy dependency on boost components. But for our demise, we were not depending on you know simple stuff like I don't know boost program option or boost thread or whatever. No. We are depending probably on, of, on the most obscure Boost libraries. Boost MPL, Boost Vision, Boost Proto, Boost Preprocessor, and a bunch of probably Boost Variant too. Uh, and they have all one thing in common, which is atrocious compile time. So we wanted to get you know, rid of this fat somehow, uh, not because we found that Boost was bad, but we, we need to evolve out of this. And uh, we also had a lot of dependence on other third-party libraries because back in the day we had no portable threading libraries, so we had to work with whatever uh, TBB, pthread, whatever. Uh, same for, uh, for example, we, we had a huge dependency on MPI stuff like this, and we wanted the standards to, you know, like through STD threads, through all the futures and asynchronous computation, bring us some solution on that. So I spoke about compile time. 
Okay, so that's the main issues, that are our main issues, actually. Uh, we found out that people, when they compile code using our libraries, they got into this very funny state of mind. That means that if after 20 seconds, my, my, let's say my GCC on my command line didn't go to the next file, something's wrong, and I should, you know, kill the process and see what I did, okay? And uh, getting below these 20 seconds, you know, psychological buyer was actually pretty complex. Uh, we had, oh, well, use cases, Mm -hmm. where basically you could physically go and fetch a coffee, drink it and come back, you know, and it was still not done compiling. So we really, really wanted to know why we were into these states of, of you know, faith. And one thing we, we found out is, well, there's a lot of features that actually incidentally have an effect of compile time. And the main um, problem was uh, symbol name length and the way symbol names are mangled, and the amount of symbol names you have to deal with. And a lot of uh, way of writing code in C++ or 3 were actually very error prone on this point, and we hoped that using the proper C++ 1114 features will help us going there. So we were probably focusing on those five uh, points, so tape deduction tools like auto, decker type, and uh, function training return types, and so on viadic templates with the hope that they will eradicate the need of macros, anonymous function or lambda functions that will probably be the solution to all or most of our extension point issues, tuples uh, with the hope that we can actually get rid of Bruce Fusion using that, and threading support, and more than threading support, the fact that the asynchronous, you know, future async promise interface could be extended to other type of machines. So we were thinking about getting shorter compile time because that's our main objectives. Uh, simple interaction with the users. Less external dependency, mostly on the threading and topple parts, and uh, shorter compile time again. Well, and so what do, what do we do? Well, we say, okay, let's take a, a random code base, you know, put some autodecker type where it makes sense and where it clearly simplifies the code. Uh, use via the template wherever. Uh, put some SCD futures instead of our pthread-based code, and just use Lambda whenever we wanted to pass a function to some algorithms. Uh, do that for a week, call it a day, thanks for coming to my talk. Except that didn't turn that well. Uh, result was actually underwhelming. Uh, the compile time was, was slightly better, probably 20%. Uh, and we had what I call a lot of smelly codes because we had to still have stuff that say, oh, okay, you are on this version of Visual Studio and not this one, so I can do the very compact way, so let me use a macro to tell you what you should be doing. Uh, we found out that there was a huge dip discrepancy between compilers on the STL quality of implementation, especially on futures. Uh, depending on the compilers slash OS slash uh, implementation, uh, you could have up to, up to a factor of three in terms of performances. And there was nothing we could actually do if we were using raw futures. And uh, the customization was actually still problematic because uh, for function it was okay, okay, just pass a lambda and, and call it a day. But it turns out that even in C++14, if it doesn't take care, your lambdas can be very hard to write, and we just move the problem somewhere else. So we needed to go, you know, find a way to do this better. So it was clearly not a, you know, like a weekend project, okay? We, we had to do it differently. And the first lesson we learned is that if you want to migrate something to C++14, you have to consider rebuilding the library in a C++14 idiomatic way. It's not a work of, you know, changing the color of the carpet, putting a bit of paint on the roof and call it a day. You have to make your house anew. And it sounds daunting because that means a lot of time writing codes, lot of time checking if it doesn't break and so on and so on. But that's the only way we found out about actually getting benefits out of that. And actually, well, we had a, a cool discussion about that yesterday at, at the dinner. It means that whenever you try to clean up your code, the one uh, hint that means that you are doing it right is that your old code base should shrink. Okay, and the new features can you know, increase the code base size. But whenever you touch at something that was there before, I mean, either you fix something, okay, either its code size should shrink. 
Okay. If it doesn't shrink, you're not doing anything correctly. So you have the technology, we can rebuild it. So that's what we did. So we took a bunch of problems, one after the others. Okay, and we, we tried to see what, what actually was the, the impact. So we tried to go over a bunch of those um, techniques, okay, ranging from simple to uh, not simple, try to explain what's going on and what we found out about to be, to be the real reason it was working on. So the first stuff we wanted to, to do again properly is the use of auto and decker type. So auto uh, is basically a way you can slap instead of a variable type and it basically says whatever you initialize this variable with, uh, take its type and that's the exact type of the variables. Um, you can also use Yodo as, as a function written types, with or without training written types, and it, for, it pro provides you a way to not have to guess which type should be going in your functions, uh, because sometimes you can't even know it, okay? And it makes the uh, writing of complex template function far easier. Yodo has a bit of uh, pitfalls. Uh, Basically, the compiler does is whenever you try to, re to find out what the type of auto is, it basically works the same as template type deductions. So it has a tendency to uh, deduce value type, even if your stuff is returning a reference, and you can use qualificator on auto to be sure that something is exactly what you want. And on the other side, you have decker type, which is more like, it's more like a size of, you know, um, cousins. As you give him an expression, and it tells you, okay, this expression evaluates exactly into these types. And the keyword is exactly. That means that if you call a function that returns a reference to int, and you put that into an auto variable, the variable will be an int, not a reference to int. And if you say that A is a decal type of the, calling, the call of F, you will get the reference. So usually what you do is you use auto to simplify a storing variable with complex or generic types, you simplify function return type computation, and decker type is mostly used to uh, wor write uh, more simple type deduction based meta programs. Um, so you end up with a shorter code, okay, because you can write auto instead of type name, std vector of t dot dot const iterator, and stuff like this. And it's still more generic. Basically, auto is the most generic types that exist, is the correct type for whatever you are doing right now. Okay. And it prevents what we call the type intuition errors, which are basically you are in the middle of writing a complex generic function that takes template type name T, U, V, X, Y, and you know that your written type is something that depends on T and U and Y in some complex stuff that you put into a meta function, and you, you get the type of, out of it, and that's the type you should be having. Except if you look at exactly what's going on into the function, it's not my written type of t u v dot dot type, it should have been my written type of t cons u reference v dot dot types. And so what happens? Both of those types are actually convertible one to the others, usually, but you compile two different symbol names instead of one, and so compile time er uh, issues and issues. So sometimes you're really, really sure that that's the type you should be having there. It's not this one, it's a closed one, so it works. And probably it works transparently in terms of performance, except you spend twice the time resol resolving the type. So by using auto or decal type or any combination thereof, you basically just say, yeah, put whatever it should be things. And uh, actually, the compiler has to find out less symbols, because usually they, they have it already. So it just takes it from where it was stored and put it in the correct way, instead of trying to guess again what's the type of your variable. So all in all, it should be, you know, uh, a win-win. So the question is, uh, that was a, a huge question for a time, is when should we use auto? It was a huge controversy about that. People think that it actually makes the code less clear, and so on and so on. So Herb Sutter coins this almost always auto philosophy that say, use auto like everywhere, except probably in two cases. You have a non-template public function in your API, Okay, and uh, if it's a public function, someone is probably going to use it and try to look at the doc. And if it's non-template, it has very few business being having a written type of auto. I really want to know if this frigging function give me a double, a vector, or whatever. It's not templated, so the type should be known. And the other case is sometimes you write code, and at some point in your code flow, 
you really, really, really want to have this variable being a char or a double for precision purpose or for you know pre uh, performance purpose. And in this case, if you really, really want the type to be something, you just say it. Okay. And if not, well, just use auto. Beware of the deduction rule I speak about. I mean, it works like template deduction, not like decal type. So sometimes you have to pay a bit to get all the reference air value, air value nest correctly, but use auto whenever. And when do we use decal type? Well, you, you have the trivial decal type auto, uh, auto function return types uh, usage. Uh, it's also a very nice tool for writing meta programs. Uh, because sometimes, instead of having a very complex template, um, you know, uh, specialization maps that say whenever you get this type, you get this type, and so on and so on, you can actually write a function that use simple function overload that say, oh, if you give me a value of type this, I'll give you back a type that. And if you give me something else, you get something else. And you can have declaration, not, oh, sorry, yeah, declaration, not even definition of functions, say type something, give you type something else. And you can just say that your meta function is using my meta function equal decal type something, okay, calling your function with a type that would get passed to your meta function. So it simplifies the writing of complex meta function and sometimes the writing of non-complex one. And you can also, you, you still have to use it if you want to trigger Sphine uh, in some context of uh, auto function written type. So we do this. We, we, we apply this always almost auto rules like everywhere, everywhere we could. Uh, and basically, yes, once you have used that everywhere, yes, you get the benefits that was written on the can. So if you use the almost always auto, you have to use it in a viral way. It's not something you do there and there. You have to do it everywhere. Because the less time you have to force the compiler to compute the symbol types, the best you are. So this AAA, like, uh, like it's usually um, shrink to, uh, it's exactly the way to go. Okay. Auto everywhere except for these two corner cases and done. And no, your code is not going less clear. It's always readable because this variable is the type it should be, done. Which type is it? Well, if you put auto, you don't really care. You just want to store this value and do something else with it. Okay? Well, so the next step was actually looking at Viadix templates. So I think that Peter is giving a talk about Viadix templates as, uh, right now. Uh, well, too bad. Um, <laughs> I will probably less informative because I have less slide to work with, but this is what we found out. So just to, to get an overview, so Vialic templates lets you write stuff like typename dot 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 ts, which defines a pack of types. So whenever you pass an arbitrary number of types to your function or your templates class, featuring a template uh, parameter pack, uh, all the types you pass are captured into this pack of types, and uh, you have a way to actually play with it. So you can call, I didn't put it there, but you can call the fancy uh, size of dot 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 functions and we tell you exactly how many stuff are in the types pack. And you can use dot 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 on the other side, okay, uh, to perform what we call a pack expansion. So we, we take whatever is in the type pack, okay, and just, you know, expand it uh, in, a sep in, in a comma separated list of types or, or values. Uh, it also works with integral templates parameters, so you can have a template int dot 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 n, which has an, an arbitrary number of integers. Uh, and you can also write dot 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 into a C++14 lambda uh, parameters um, set. Well, that's cool because if you want to write Validix functions or template with an arbitrary number of types because you are waiting, wanting to implement some kind of type list or something, uh, before, you had to use macros to say, I have this maximum amount of template types in my template classes of functions, and this is all the specialization for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, which was a lot. The pack expansion to dot, dot, dot is actually a code generation stuff. It takes whatever is in the pack, and the keyword is whatever, and just turns that into a piece of code where every instance of the pack is generated, separated by a comma. And it works on arbitrary expression, not just the type or the type and the name of the argument pack you pass to the function, 
whatever the crop you put before a dot 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 expansion, as, as long as the expression you're passing to the pack expansion operator contain a zero parameter types pack or parameter value pack, it would get expanded. So you get fancy stuff with that. So um, let's say you want to do something which is, I have a predicate, a meta predicate, it's a, it's a meta function, take the types, and it's written you a compile time boolean that say, does this type verify this or that properties? Like for example, is pointer, uh, is void, uh, is convertible, stuff like this, okay? And you want to know if all the types in uh, this type list actually verify the predicates. So is all my types pointers, for example? So uh, if you wanted to write this using C++ or tree, I would probably have a very small font uh, with a huge uh, number of macro, maybe two columns, okay? Uh, I'll just say, okay, this is a bias class, just macroify everything until you get everything done. Uh, now it's a bit better. So we say that we have a predicate, we have our type list there, which is this parameter packs. And we have two cases, okay? So either you have a single type, so you say that all is basically the application of the predicate to the type using whatever meta function pro protocols, okay? And if I have one and some others, well, it's the logical end between the predicate called on the first one and calling all with the same predicate on everything else. So this basically generate, let's say we have TS, which is TS0, TS1, TS2, TS3, basically take everything there after the first one and just unpack it again and call it the other or with one type less, doing the same recursively until we hit the one upstairs and we stop the recursions. Everything gets generated, every operators and predicates are applied and we get the results. Does it seem okay to you? Yeah, so that's basically probably what you will find if you look for how do I write template meta program using parameter packs on the internet? Uh, it's nice, it's far less lines than the equivalent C++ 0.3 versions, but there is an issue. Guess which one? Compile time. This stuff takes exactly the same amount of time as the macro versions. Why? Because it does the exact same thing, except in a more compact way. If you have a type list of, let's say, 12 types, it's this probably generates something like 13 symbols. One with one, with two, with three, with four, with five, etc., etc., plus uh, the first one, okay? So it's more compact. We can philosophically discuss if it's more readable. I think it is. It's more like, you know, you, as soon as you understand the concept of recursions. But it still has a bad compile time behavior. Okay, so how many of you are actually familiar with Terry Pratchett disk word? Don't be shy. Yeah. So the... I mean, well, dot, 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 pack expansion via the templates. You know, it's like the disk world. So the disk world is a flat disk sitting on top of, you know, a uh, bunch of elephants sitting on top of a, of a turtle. And in the uh, in very old stuff, actually, uh, people speak about the fact that the turtle itself is on another turtle and so on. So it's turtle all the way down. So we need to be viadic all the way down. You should not recurse unless forced using viadic templates, because if not, well, you're writing concise code that still compiles too slowly. So how can I turn this into a non-recursive meta functions? Well, actually, it's doable. So let's do this. So we introduce a small helper, which is called bools, which is just a, a structure that can take an arbitrary number of bools, okay? And what we do is we say that, okay, if I build the type bools true and then all the types, all the predicates apply to all the types. And I build another bool, which is the predicate applied to all the type and then true. If both types are the same, then all the types verify the predicates. Does it? Yeah. Let's say TS for every TS verifies the predicates. We end up with true, 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 some amount of time. And the other one is true, 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 true from the predicate and then the true. So same types. What happens if, let's say, TS4 returns false, true the predicates? The first stuff will get you true, first true, 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 false, true. 
Okay, so false is in the fifth position. And the other side, it's in the fourth position because we switched, you know, we, we just shifted the value. So as soon as one is not at the same place, I mean, as so, I, I say, uh, sorry, as soon as one is fourth, it's not at the same place in both types. So the types are not equals. It means that they don't all verify the predicates. And what do I do? I don't recurse. I let the compiler expand stuff. How many types do I need to compile? I will compile the one type for all and two types for the two different balls. And in the case, it's actually the same. If all should return true, it's actually two types I generate because the, the compiler will memorize that those is the same. Probably even mangle them the same way. Okay, so now the good news is uh, it took us like, I don't know, probably two or three weeks to find out about these guys. <laughs> uh, it's actually someone from uh, a, co a contributor to one of our libraries that came out with this. So the first five minutes was what? You know? <laughs> uh, and then we understood what was going on and said, oh crap, we should do that like everywhere. <laughs> and uh, well, that's a cool thing. But probably you have heard about this function. It was, it was a Twitter post and a blog post by Sean Parent, Eric Nieber, and a couple of others probably, well, six or seven months ago. Uh, what does this beast do? What, what, what is going on? Okay, well, let's say we want to have a function that takes an arbitrary functors, okay, or lambda, whatever, and you want to apply this function to all the argu other arguments pass to the function. Okay, so let's say I write for each arg lambda auto x stdc out x, okay, that's f, and then comma, one, three, 3.5, some string, and so on and so on. This stuff would just print every argument, okay, one after the others. It will apply the function f to each argument. One way to do this is do recursions. You say, okay, I have a valid x number of parameters, I take one, I call f on it, and then recurse. Actually, you can write it this way in a one-liner without any recursions, generating the proper number of symbol, one. Okay? So it looks strange for three reasons. First, well, well we have to deal with forward because we really, really want to be, you know, L value correct. So we, we have a L, sorry, we have a forwarding reference there. So we need to forward whatever A is. That's one crux. Uh, this std ref call there is made so we can actually apply the same F every time. So if F is stateful, we can update the state correctly. That's noises. The funky stuff is that, what did I say? Dot, dot, dot expansion generates, takes a bit of expression and generates a comma separated version of this expression for every element of the pack. Keyword is, comma separated. And it turns out there is a lot of funny places where you really, really want to have a comma separated list of stuff. So function calls, okay. Function arguments, template arguments, braces. Braces, it's something that you write and you have A, comma B, comma C, comma D. So question is, where do you put the braces in so it doesn't blow up? Well, one place to put it is a constructor of an initializer list. And before anybody, you know, cries and, and says that's actually dangerous because, uh, you know, the lifetime of initializer list content is, you know, well defined and so on, it works because it doesn't do anything with the initializer list anyway. We just use it as a way to iterate over whatever that. And so the question is, why, what is this comma zero there? Well, what happens if f returns void? Or what if f returns something which is not an int? or is different type depending on the type of what's going on. Well, we have to find a way to homogeneous that everywhere. So we just use comma where to say, yeah, do whatever you want with F, I don't care, then return zero, please. And put that into the, uh, into the initializer list. And what we do is, uh, usually functors are traditionally passed by value. That's what we do there. But if you want to pass a stateful function, it's cool if you can get the new updated state afterwards. So what we decide to do is to return f after everything is done. 
Okay, that's what we do there, so you can actually look at what you did during this call. So that's a one-liner, that's probably the most ugliest one-liner I ever saw. Get the job's done, okay? And uh, as everything ugly, you just, you know, hide it in a box, okay? And you use the box. So that's one tool that is cool to have. But the very funny thing is that's the perfect demonstration about you can write everything you just using expansion pack, not having to recurse. So, the ratio, so it starts her all the way down. So don't recurse via DIX unless you are forced to. You have algorithm, you can't do anything else than recursing. Right? So you have a type list and you want the last one. Good luck. You have to recurse because, alas, I'm not allowed to write decal type ts dot 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 because decal type is not a via DIX pack expansion context. It should be fixed. Um, so as I said, each recursion generates a type that needs to be mangled, that needs to be memorized, that needs to be fetched later. Okay, so it takes times. So what you should need to do is, can I write this pack expansion stuff into something that I can walk into a comma-separated context that exactly do what I want? And most of the time, well, I mean, it's a bit of a nasty, you know, occupation, but most of the time you can find a way to do this. So you get less symbol generated, mangled, memorized. The executor is actually slimmer because sometimes you just generate all those intermediate functions and they take space into the binary and it compiles faster. That's what we wanted to do. So if you do Viadix, it's Viadix all the way down. So the only stuff you have to, you should be doing is dot dot dotting stuff, not recursions, unless you can't. But most of the time you can. So, and those two first stuff actually help us a lot. I mean, the, uh, the Viadic we write uh, shows off something like probably 30% of compile time in most of our libraries. Uh, we, we wrote a lot of functions, uh, the way we wrote for each args, or using for each args actually, which is a very useful function. Uh, I think it's proposed to, to the standard, something like this. If, we, if it's not, it should be. Um, so yeah, Viadic all the way down. You should not recurse on your Viadic pack. So now lambda function. Well, I have a love eight relationship with Lambda. Uh, my, my first language was actually uh, KMO, okay, which is functional languages. So Lambda function, anonymous stuff was, you know, bread and butter. So I was very really excited by when it came to C++. But I was a bit, you know, cr cranky about the fact it was exactly not, you know, a real Lambda and so on and so on. But actually, uh, it's worse than that. So I remember at some point there was an interview by, of Biane where he says that he was basically, you know, not regretting but having concern about the fact that people use templates to do stuff they were not intended with. I think I have bad news for him because now people are doing stuff with Lambda they are not intended with. <laughs> and, uh, well, I think when you see what we do with them, you will probably agree with that. So what is, what is lambda? It's an anonymous function block, so you can write an inline function into a very stealth way whenever you need it. It's a very cool tool in, in the software design um, you know, way because it makes the code very local. It doesn't have to find where the damn do stuff function is into your transform code. It's just right there, okay? So that's very important. Uh, and now in C14, it can be viadic, it can be generic, which is a great, great, great improvement. And what it does behind the scene, it just generates a magical callable object for you wherever you put it, which is basically it's a struct with an operator function call. And uh, that's where the problem begins. So it's less worse for the compiler because it doesn't have to, you know, uh, find, the other, find the other function, do whatever. It's better for performance because it, you doesn't have to carry on a, a function pointer. It's actually in line and whatnot. And actually, the, the special types that get generated by the compiler is done in a way so, well, I, I, I'm not sure how it works, but it looks like it, it just pre mangle it or something. I mean, it has a strange name and nobody cares, so just, you know, store the mangle versions. And the very cool stuff is that enable what we call higher order programming. So higher order programming is using functions, which are called higher order functions. Higher order functions are functions where parameters and or return value are functions themselves. And that's something which is very, very powerful. So if, I don't know if you went to the uh, functional programming talk yesterday morning, I guess. But that's basically what I was speaking about. So have a look at this. Same games than before. What is going on? Well, this one is easier. 
So if you want to understand, let's start from the bottom. So I call a function called skewfine. Oh, okay, it should have been an S. Okay, sorry for the dipo. On this value, what is sqassign is this. It's something which is the result of compose of a lambda, take a float x, return the square, and the function pointer to was a sin f standard function, okay, that called sinus on the floating point value. And you, we pass that to a function called compose. Uh-huh. So what does it do? Well, look at compose. It takes two values of type f and g. We don't care. And it returns something, auto. And this something is actually a lambda function, uh, which takes one parameter of an arbitrary type, x, auto x, uh, and it captures by a value f and g. That's a, the square bracket does. It's the environment captures. Uh, you put there every symbol that you use in the lambda, which is not a parameter. And what does this lambda does? It just do f of g of x. Yes, that's, that's a small o in math. That's f o g. It's a composition of function. And it's, it's a bloody one-liner. Now, you take two functions of arbitrary types, you put it into the lambda, take, you save it into a box, and this box you can call it later using the function collaborators, and it will just do this f of g of x. Okay? And so you can actually look at what we do there. We store the result of compose in S SQRSYN. It's not the application of this to something. It's just the whatever result of this function is, is a function I can call later. Oh, but if it's a function, oh, I, I should have put the example later, but, but you can do something like compose of something with compose of something else and something else and so on and so on because compose gives you a function, which is exactly what compose wants as an input. So it's fully composable, okay? Um, like exercise for the reader, okay? Try to write compose in C++03. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm available up to next December, uh, if you want to take your time. Uh, we did it a long time ago, and it's a bloody 600 lines monsters, okay? Because the problem is, Okay, how do I know which type I should return from these things? Because I, do exactly, I don't know how f and g are supposed to give me their result types. So I have to go through oops and stuff to block the function to something I can actually ask them what type they return. And sometimes you can because the bloody stuff is template, so you have to go through the result of protocol and so on and so on and so on. And if you want to have something as terse as that, it's a nightmare. It's a smaller nightmare in C++11. The so only issue is that we don't have um, generic lambda, so this lambda is actually an actual functor, but it's already far more compact. And the C++14 version, I mean, uh, it's art. Okay. It's the most simple way I wish I could write a composition function function. Okay. If you have a smaller code, I really wanted to see it. Okay. Well, and put it compose on the same lines as the template doesn't count. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And if we could do this, it means that we can basically do whatever you want. That's a very important example. Uh, it's probably one of the, of the most elegant stuff you can write with Lambda. So now let's have a look at the less elegant stuff. So let's say we have these functions, the regular functions. Uh, it takes type C and two other types T and F as, as parameters. And uh, C is actually an integral constant, okay, or probably an integral Boolean. And uh, we use enable if to say that if the value in C is true, then you return T by forwarding it properly. And if the value in C is false, we return the second one. So you can write code that say, this is a compile time condition. And depending on this compile time condition, give me the first or the second parameters. OK, sounds stupid. Okay. But now, let's say for whatever reasons, and we add this reason at some point, you need to write your own vector-like structures. Because vector doesn't fit what you want to do, allocator doesn't fit what you want to do, you have a very precise use cases. And you write this, and at some point you say, oh wait, I have to be careful because when I default construct my, ve my pseudo vector or something, I probably have to see if the type is trivial or not, and if it is not trivial, I have to explicitly call the construct, the con default constructor on every value in my data block. Oh, well, what about writing this? 
So for each value between begin and end, uh, I will select on the fact that the type of my content is trivial or not. Well, if it's trivial, I don't have to, have to do anything on it. So I just pass the empty lambda. Okay, so the empty generic lambda is something you use a lot, actually. Could be cool if we could have it somewhere like, you know, empty function, like std empty function. So it doesn't do anything. And if not, what you do is you capture by reference your allocator. And you do that for every value between begin and end. Uh, what you do is you call the uh, alloc t is the allocator threads stuff. You call, you call construct using this allocator on these addresses. What happens? Well, that's basically a static if. Because uh, depending on the, this condition, this code or this code will be uh, selected okay, and passed to for each. And by the fact that those lambda are generic, okay, the codes they contain are not evaluated there. Will be only evaluated if they are called. So you could write stuff there that only works if this is true and it still compiles when it's false. Because you only get to compile the code of the lambda whenever it's called and not when it's declared. So you can have, let's say, a poor man's static if using these kind of threads. So that's another usage of uh, generic lambdas. You can uh, fake the compiler into delaying the time where it has to call a function and doesn't care about the code the function contains until it's the, the correct time to do it. That was a very helpful stuff. Too. Okay, so now I have, I, have, I have bad news. But before the bad news, the issue. So if you have an issue that can be solved by using an higher order function based solutions, and there is a ton of problems that can be solved this way, there is a lot of literature on the, on the subject, use viadic and polymorphic lambdas to do this. Don't try to run your own run of the mill functor solution base. Use lambda. Write your own, if you need, write your own small uh, lambda toolbox for composing, for getting the number of parameters, for, and so on and so on, and try to use this. A lot of problems can be solved because it's only, it's only uh, a variation on composing functions. And that's what lambda are for. That's helped us a lot because remember what I say about customization process. When we start saying do this and that, and we just say to people, okay, just write a generic polymorphic lambda, do whatever you want inside, and we take care of that. And what we did is either the lambda they gave us as a proper prototype we wanted to have, proper number of parameters or stuff like this, and then we can call it directly. And if not, we could actually look at what the lambda was doing in terms of written types or number of parameters and adapt it in the proper lambda we need. Oh, what do we do? We just make another lambda, put the first one inside, and you know, stitch the pipes. So lambdas, uh, this, this version of anonymous function in C++, I mean, next to the fact that it lets you use ST algorithm in a more uh, simple way, is very powerful in its own. You can actually build, I think Paul Futz, as, as you write something which is called Boost Functionals, where you have a bunch of those kind of tools dealing with function, composition, extraction of value, and so on. Okay, that was the, um, okay, how to say that? was something very variable. And, uh, and then an accident occurred. Two years ago, uh, I get the task to mentor Luis Dion during this Google Summer of Code. Uh, so for people that doesn't know Luis Dion, Luis Dion is the author of Boost Anna. Okay, have a look at this. It's wonderful. And uh, when I was doing this mentoring stuff, we, we found out something. It's not done anymore like, exactly like this in Anna, but the technique is very funny for some definition of funny. So, <clears throat> as I say, okay, that's the part we should get, you know, very well seated. As I said, lambda are basically magic functor types that get auto-generated by the compilers. Okay, and what happens is that when you put something into the lambda captures environment, it's just translated into members, and the constructor snap of the functor type for the lambda snaps them, put it into the member, and so on. So basically. The compiler is generating a struct with a proper complex constructor for you. Okay, and that's all done very, very fast. So that means that, well, okay, uh, lambda can be used as throwaway struct. I need a struct that aggregates stuff and do something on it, but I really, really need, just need them now, and I don't care about the rest. So um, that's a cheap way to make a tuple. Okay, because what is a tuple? It's basically a struct that is a collection of members of different types with some kind of interface. So the best way to implement a tuple is actually to make it a lambda. Yeah. 
Okay, I, I didn't sleep on that for a week. So, well, let, let's get, let's, let's, let's actually get an example. So, should, can I get actually some internet there? Yeah, it's actually frightening. Okay, but it works. That's the worst. So, let's go somewhere because I, I, I'm not fencing running Visual Studio on this beast. Okay, so it's non embarrassing code. Great. <laughs> oh, come on. What did I do? Okay, what's the crap? Okay, so. <clears throat> So let's say you have a, what about zooming actually? Okay, Chrome, please zoom. Okay, is it okay for everybody up there? Again? Okay, fine. So let's say you have that. You, you have a template. You have a template tuple structure. But look at this strange thing. It only has one type. Okay, just do this. That's a tuple of exactly whatever types you want, but only one type. So what you do is you can write stuff like this. Okay. Okay. So you don't really care about the written types. So let's call that make tuple. So I will just make very, very, very crude stuff because a lot of problems arise afterwards. So let's say you, you capture everything by consref, okay. Uh, tac, tac, tac. So you have all your stuff you want to put into the tuple. So what do you do? Well, first things first, as I say, you make a lambda. Because everybody is better with a lambda. Uh, problem is you can't write that. That's a shame. Well, same. <laughs> <laughs> I, really, I really wish, I don't know if I have anybody from the standard in the room. Yeah. Uh, so it would be cool if we could write that, you know. <laughs> just, just saying, okay? <laughs> okay, and what does this lambda take? It takes something. V, okay. And what does this lambda does? It calls V on everything. Okay, doesn't look like that's happening. And so what do we do? Oh, well, well. Let's compute the type of R. Okay? It's some types. And then, well, just return the tuple of that. Okay? Okay, why is it a tuple? What the crap is going on? So, whatever the M you pass to this make tuple stuff end up into the automatic value captured over there. So, that means that inside the lambda, you have access to all the M you pass to the function. And what this thing does, it takes a V, which is something, but something interesting, it looks like a function. V of M dot dot dot. It's basically a visitor. So these things get everything and you do something with it. Okay? So okay. something you can write is actually, uh, let's say I have a tuple. Okay, let's say I actually know how to write stuff. Oh, uh, this one is easy. Uh, you want the size of a tuple of containing some things. Okay, what, what should I, what did I say about, okay, my big, Fat fingers. So how do you compute the size of the functor? Oh, well, that's easy. You start writing a lambda. That's, okay, that's, okay. This lambda takes some amount of members. And uh, what's the size of my tuple? Well, it's size of dot, dot, dot of my members. Okay, so if you have a Caesar or something, just tell me, I, I can just stop there. So, and what do I do now? Well, I, I should pass this visitor to whatever is inside my tuple. So, it's probably something like return t dot, how do I call that? Representation, okay. So, that, what is representation? It's an instance of whatever the type of the tuple, which is basically the type of the lambda. So, it's the lambda we put inside. So, we just pass s to this guy. Bam, and we have the size of the tuple. So let's see if it works. And by working, I mean if it doesn't blow up the world. Okay. Okay. So let's say you have uh, something which is some tuple, T, which is max tuple of, I don't know, 1, 3.5, something. Ah, that's Okay. So normally, this should work. Keyword is normally. Okay. So that's live without any repetitions and no no nets okay 
So let's see what's going up. Okay, 10 bucks, I forgot the semicolon somewhere, but that would be a... Oh, IO streams. Oh, I think they are included, no? No, it, they are. So it compiles, okay, it, it looks like it compiles slowly. I blame the internet, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what did I do? No matching function to blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, sorry for that. Probably this. Okay. Okay, that, we have some warnings, okay. And, uh, okay, and I don't know how to write, okay. What? <laughs> there is no, okay, what the fuck is going on? Uh, oh yeah, because I'm stupid. That's not new. <laughs> you can quote me on that, I'm stupid, yeah. Okay, does it work now? Or? Yeah, four. That's, yeah, well. So that's, that's, that's probably the most complex way to write four. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and we got those warning because actually GCC doesn't think we use members, so well. But we got what you need. So you can play with that, it's actually funny. Uh, you can write a lot of things like this. And uh, there is exactly one use case where we really, really want something like this. Okay. So we, I spoke about Boost Simni, I spoke about NT2, which is this MATLAB-like um, library. They all use something, which is expression templates. So expression templates, uh, is a way to implement DSL in C++. You abuse operator overloading to have operators and function be the lightweight representation of the abstract syntax tree of your expression that you can carry around. And whenever you are okay with what you have, you can say, now do whatever is inside this expression. It's a way to actually have expression level introspections. It's very, very, very AV on compile time because you end up having very complex type every time you add a new node. But it allow, you, you can actually generate arbitrary code for an arbitrary high-level API, which is very, f uh, very important for us. It's a well-known compile time org, like, like everybody knows that. Uh, it may lead to complex code base, even if you use tools like Boost Proto, which is already leveraging a lot. And its interaction with C++11 is crooky, because what if I have a function taking an expression, allocating memory for some of the terminals, and returning an expression containing this locally allocated memory will blow up. So we try to fix that, using lambda, of course. So tuples are heterogeneous list of types. Oh, that's cool. That means that we can use tuples to make trees. Okay. Well, and the IST we want expression template to generate are basically trees. Okay. So let's implement an IST as a tuples, which means let's implement IST as a lambda. Okay. Normal. And uh, there is a very few funny benefits. The type of the lambda is automatically generated by the compiler. It's some arbitrary name. Uh, it may or may not contain information from where the lambda co comes from. Uh, the example I would do there is using Visual Studio, which do the right, right things. So props to the Visual Studio guys. And so you, get, you end up with shorter names for your expression types. So you get better compile time. And you can actually do something so move semantic works correctly. So, stay it. So, usually what you do when you have an expression template library is something which is called as expert that takes parts of something and make, make a lazy expression out of them. So that, the binary as expert we, we wrote. So, it starts by defining a lambda because that's basically five minutes we didn't. And this lambda contains a local structure. So you are entitled to do this. And these structures contain something based on the type of the stuff you want to store. And as a constructor, they just forward everything properly. What storage type does, it says if the type you pass is actually an air value reference, I store it by value. And if it's another kind of reference, I keep it this way. This means that if you pass L value to your constructors of expressions, you will still keep the, the reference. But then when you have an air value, you know it's a temporary, so you have to save it inside the IST. So we store the air value by copying into something. Okay? So that's basically all going there. So we define this structure, 
And what the lambda does is just say, uh, whatever C0 and C1 is, I return an, uh, an instance of this type. Now look, is node a template class? No. But it contains template type inside that get fetched from the outside template. That means that the types that get out of this lambda contain elements which type is dependent on the template elements of the function outside, but which is not template itself. <laughs> what kind of drug is he on? So what do we do with this arise type lambda? The same stuff that we did before. So we have an expert kind of expression container like tuple. So we compute the type of arise type and we just make a node out of that. Okay, and the constructor of expert forward everything correctly and so on and so on. So funny, funny thing is that what we've just been doing is white washing the symbol name. So let's, let's have an example. So let's say you have a function taking something and we just build a binary expression with two of those things. And we do it for an x, for an f of x, and an f of f of x, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. If you do this with a regular expression template stuff, you probably end up with, OK, um, expert of f, type of x, type of x. And this one would be expert of, expert of type of x, type of x, expert type of x, type of x, and so on, and so on. It's quadratic, OK? It's just blow up. So that's, so I just print the type of this. Okay, and I printed those using uh, Visual Studio. So normally, the tree, the tree structure from the fourth one should be far bigger than the first one. And before that, we were like, oh my god, and we end up with the huge types. That's the types that Visual Studio print. Whatever the complexity of the expression, their size is exactly the same. Because you know that whatever is inside Exper is a return is of it's a node which comes from lambda 009 ABA, blah, 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 dot, dot, operator parent. Hey, which is the same for the other one, which is the same for the third one, which is the same for the fourth one. So we have a way to basically say, OK, uh, this thing has a fixed size name, depending on the complexity. So you can actually hide template complexity inside the lambda, washing away the types, returning an array of types as the parameters of the lambda. It's a bit worse on GCC because GCC insists of naming the lambda with the name of the function it's calling from, but it's still smaller than the regular template expression. So I see it again because I don't see it often. Visual Studio is doing the correct thing there. <laughs> so GCC guys, clan guys, I don't know if you watch me later, but do this, okay? <laughs> There is one issue, let's be frank, is that if you do something wrong inside these errors type functions, you end up with a very funny error message that says that um, in lambda f3577734 fives, this is wrong. Good luck. And I don't know if you ever, I mean, Visual Studio has this bad bit to tell you something is wrong there, but sending you somewhere else, okay? <laughs> So it can be a bit difficult to debug. So the, the advice I can give you is don't do wrong stuff into this. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, I mean, I, we tried with, I, I, we still have to try that with uh, MSVCCL to see if actually, you know, the uh, magical clang carrot doesn't put us on the correct places. We, we have to test that. But it's a funny experiment, actually. Uh, and it solves both stuff at once. So the, the storage types tricks let us have expressions that doesn't blow up when you, when you use temporaries, and we limit the size of the symbols. So that basically compiles three times faster than Boost product. It's not features complete, but we know how fast compiling expression templates. We're still hammering out details, but it's far, very, very promising. So the last lesson is, you can use Lambda as disposable data structures to reduce symbol size. That's what I call the last resort solution, but it works quite well. So let's wrap, it, let's wrap it up. So what we wanted to be doing is uh, see how changing the code base to C++ alter it in, in, a, in a significant way. You must adapt your code to C++14 to do C++14 things and not try to just, you know, sugarcoat your old code. It has to be radical. And when it's radical, you actually reap the benefits of it. And you have to be creative because it is rewarding. 
So I would just conclude on that, that it was actually a very nice experiment. It's not something we did it alone. I have a lot of people to thank, mostly, uh, so I say, with John, Augustine, uh, Burgi, uh, Edward, and some of our co-authors that came up with some of those techniques. Okay. Um, as a conclusion, thanks for your attention. Just wanted to say that uh, don't be afraid to do this. Uh, it can be done on the side, okay? And uh, whenever something is done, you can integrate it back. But you will get the full benefit when you, you really went go through all of this. So thank you again for your attention. If you have any questions. <laughs> or, or I killed everybody, I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to ask how much speed up did you get with the trick with uh, adding the, the template generated types in the lambda uh, in comparison to having them outside? Generally? Okay, so it depends on the complexity of the output type, but it's at least twice. Okay. Twice faster to comply. Oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs>